It's going to be an interesting one with COVID and the pandemic. Our whole lives have changed, and I'm so grateful for all our industry panelists uh, to join us today and give us their time and their advice. We have moderator Jacques Telemach from the Filmmakers Alliance, and he's also a filmmaker. He will be moderating the panel, and um, I'm going to let him take it from here. I'm going to sign off, and hopefully we'll see you at all the other events, and thank you for joining us. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Shira. Um, yeah, we're uh, in a really, obviously, incredibly unique time, and we're all sort of trying to figure out uh, what's happening and how to continue doing what we do and what the future holds for us. And luckily, I have these amazing people here to, to uh, enter into that discussion. I don't know. Uh, hopefully, we can provide some answers and direction, but even just ask the right questions uh, will be exciting and useful for all of us, including me, like I'm a filmmaker like anybody else. So um, yeah, well, let's start just by, uh, I'll have everybody introduce themselves and say a little something and then uh, we'll get into the meat of it. So uh, Allison, you wanna introduce yourself? Well, you're muted. Hi everyone, I'm muted. Yeah, um, hi, I'm Allison Amen, and I am current. I am a producer, longtime producer. Um, I'm currently working on with a small agency startup called Superconductor. Um, you working with brand clients like Nike, Velos, um, Nature Conservancy, and Amazon to help them both create creative and um, content for them. I had a production company for 20 years called Chelsea Pictures and during that time I worked with a lot of uh, filmmakers, independent filmmakers, especially documentarians. Um, I worked with Alex Gibney and Lauren Greenfield, Amir Barlev, uh, Kiernan Fitzgerald, David Gordon Green amongst others. Um, we uh, won a lot of awards during the 20 years, um, including um, an Emmy for a project we did with Procter & Gamble called Like a Girl, which maybe people remember. Um, I also helped produce, uh, I was a executive producer on Queen of Versailles and uh, an associate producer on The Kingmaker with Lauren. Um, so I have a background of both producing for branded work, which is the majority of what I do, but also um, documentary. Cool. And Marta? Hi. Oh, yeah. Marta okay. Cunningham, um, filmmaker, um, actually presently working on Modern Love season two, which is an Amazon show, and uh, work with various different companies, AMC, HBO, um, doing a lot of uh, TV um, episodic work drama and comedy, um, made a film called Valentine Road, uh, which was a documentary with HBO uh, in 2013. And, and since then, we've really just kind of been in the narrative space and doing episodic work. Did 23 episodes in the last four years. Okay, Pat. Oh, wait, Kat, Caleb. Hi, I'm, Caleb I'm the managing editor of Movie Maker Magazine. Um, so we're more on the press side of things, but I will say that Movie Maker's main mission is to focus on sort of practical filmmaking advice for our readers. And so obviously, as you imagine, in the past year or in the past six months, feels like years, uh, our shift is kind of, we've kind of shifted our focus to, you know, let our readers who are primary, primarily filmmakers you know, know what they need to know when it comes to producing in the pandemic legally, what they need to know, all of those things. Um, so I'm happy to talk about that and as well, you know, press coverage. Great. And Pat. Hi, I'm Pat Saperstein and I'm deputy editor at Variety. I cover a number of different things, but I'm kind of the online film editor and I cover documentaries and film festivals and independent film. And I also kind of uh, help shape our coverage of a lot of those areas. Uh, I've been at Variety quite a long time, um, but I wanted to say that one of the things that we have evolved doing during the pandemic is also adapting um, to the to a world with no events, which um, you know, as difficult as having a film festival um, 
uh, that doesn't take place physically is for filmmakers. It's also very difficult for those who cover film festivals and everything. So we've um, started doing as many, um, you know, streaming panels and streaming interviews and everything as everyone else. So that's been a really interesting evolution as well. Yeah, I, I think that we should start just by getting into that. Like, what is the lay of the land? Like, what's what's going on and what's not going on? What are some of the more dramatic changes? There's a lot of obvious changes. We should go over those. And, uh, and I'm curious about what you see as uh, some of those changes that might be more permanent in, in the way films get made and things move forward. And whoever wants to start, maybe Marta, you're, you're on set now, right? You're, you're shooting stuff now or no? I'm in uh, prep, basically. In prep. I mean, the type of prep, the prep before prep. Um, I'm ca doing casting. I was actually on a casting call just now um, before I came here. Well, how, how is that done? Like, how is it all done right now? I feel like Zoom is going to be a part of our lexicon from this point on. Um, mm -hmm. Everything's done through Zoom. Uh, I have had more COVID tests um, than I care to. <laughs> Talk about. <laughs> How often so, do they test you? Well, here's the thing: it shoots in New York. Mm -hmm. I'm actually really lucky, to be honest, yeah. because um, I was supposed to leave tomorrow, and then I was going to quarantine in, uh, you know, in a motel for two weeks in upstate New York. But New York just lifted the um, basically the quarantine demand on California. So we no longer have to quarantine. So that's really good news. Uh, so now I don't have to leave till October 1st to go shoot. Um, so that's big. And that yeah. just happened, like literally just happened Wednesday, I think it was Wednesday or Thursday. So yeah, we're, um, we're they shoot uh, Modern Love in upstate New York. We are going to be, I've already have all my, my protective gear um, was sent to me by their nurse. And, you know, we're going to be working with young people. There's going to be teens on, on this job. And we're, everyone's just going to really have to follow through with being their best self. I mean, it, a lot of it has to do with um, really trust, right? I mean, when we, when we work with other people that we don't know, we are already putting ourselves in a situation of immense trust. And as a director, I am asking my actors to share parts of themselves um, mm -hmm. that uh, normal people would feel exposed with the most personal of personal intimate person with them sharing these feelings. And I'm, you know, yelling action and cut after them. <laughs> so, you know, it's really important that we honor the actors who are going to be in these spaces. Um, they are the most vulnerable out of all of us. And I'm really, um, I feel really grateful that I'm being picked to be a part of this new process that the industry is now going to be taking a part of and that the actors that are choosing to be a part of this process, um, I have so much respect for them. And Modern Love and the production company at Amazon has been ridiculously professional, like just incredibly generous and professional. And I'm really happy that this is my first step uh, back into, um, into work um, with this level of professionalism and generosity. Had you, have you done, have you shot anything since the pandemic before this? I've had opportunities to shoot some commercials and have chosen not to. Okay. So this will be kind of new for you, like the whole process. The whole thing, absolutely. Working with it, yeah. Interesting. Allison, do you have anything to add to, to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess there's big picture and small picture, right, of what COVID means to bringing our industry about. And I've been on a couple of sets and have found them, you know, it's hard. We're we're used to touching each other and being next to each other and expressing ourselves um, in ways that, you know, PPE doesn't really help to, to give a sense of what our faces are feeling. And I found that um, it's just really important to approach every um, sit work situation with um, a much bigger sense of empathy and understanding for each other because you know it 
uh, although it's always true that you don't really know what's going on, at this point, we don't know what the stressors of each other's lives are. And, you know, for a collaborative medium that has to actually become even more collaborative because of all the ways in which we have to deal with each other in order to stay safe and continue to create content. Um, it takes a little bit more patience on everyone's part. And um, that's, that's been challenging and also beautiful to see when it comes together and, and happens. Um, different sets have had different ways of doing it. Um, I've been involved with shoots where the director has directed everything from behind a Zoom call. Um, and that has a lot of challenges. And I've been on actual live sets and that's been really interesting too. Um, you know, it, it takes everyone being really honest. I woke up this morning with a sore throat okay, what does that mean? Um, we had, I had a situation where a producer came to me and said, you know, the DP's not feeling well and he's just been on a plane to fly here to get here to shoot. And we had to have that hard conversation of saying, I'm sorry, you cannot come. We, and he, he did the scout on Zoom, basically, and then replaced himself in person. And it turned out he was COVID negative, but we just couldn't take that chance. Um, so it's a really interesting time and every situation is like learning a new way of dealing with things. So and how, how much is all this, yeah, how much is all of this impacting time and budget? Um, quite a bit, I would imagine. Oh yeah, and you know, as you could imagine, clients don't really necessarily, I mean, the, my business, the brand um, content business was tightening anyway before this happened. So nobody really wants to pay for that additional time and safety, yeah. even though they require it. So it's challenging. Okay. Yeah. Pat, Caleb, do you guys have anything? Well, I'm just really concerned about, um, you know, as you said, the, the, the cost of this to everyone, um, you know, when you, when Marta said that Amazon has been really, um, you know, wonderful and in, in accommodating everything, all that accommodating comes with a, a much higher price. And, you know, I talked to someone who was on a, um, a film recently where they had, I think, four um, COVID compliance officers or, um, you know, two nurses and two um, people just do, dealing with safety issues or something, something like that. But that's a lot of extra people to add to a small film. Um, I'm not sure, you know, exactly how many people are on each each set like that, but that one was four. And I'm just really concerned about people's ability to, you know, just to be able to make their projects in the way that they want to. And they're already kind of rewriting things so that they have fewer locations and fewer actors um, just for logistics. But I imagine that, that you also have to do that for budgetary reasons. And I think it's really gonna impact the, the content that we see. Um, hopefully, um, I mean, independent filmmakers and documentarians are the most creative, as we know. So hopefully, they'll find a way to make it all work. Um, but you know, it's it's hard. It's sad to think about everything just kind of having like a narrowing effect of fewer days you can afford to shoot or fewer locations you can go to. Yeah, extras. Yeah. You know, big scenes yeah. with extras. So like you don't want to have right. both. <laughs> Yeah. So I, I just hope that, you know, some of that is able to come back eventually, but I fear that a lot of it will just kind of become permanent. Like everyone knows how it is. If they're asked to work on a lower budget, um, then they're not going to get a larger one the next time. And unless they've had some kind of big hit in between or something. Yeah. Um, once you go back, I don't know if you can go forward. Yeah. That's yeah. And I would, I would hope that, you know, there's probably a finite number of places that can offer COVID testing. And as we kind of get used to this, like more, there'll be more opportunities for other companies to kind of offer, you know, rapid testing and that will kind of hopefully drive prices down. But yeah, I share a lot of the same concerns as Pat, which is like, how are indie like filmmakers who already have a hard enough time making films going to survive? And I, I think I do fall back on like, these are creative people and like we've found a way you know, through the decades to kind of make it work when we need to make it work. And so I would trust that they would find a path forward. 
but it still doesn't mean it's not concerning. It's not. Yeah. I mean, I think the fantastically great news about this thing in general is that there's never been a time where clearly we are all reaching for entertainment and content, right? I mean, it's the point of discussion for everybody. What amazing series have you seen? What are you binge watching? What great movies? I mean, I'm seeing more on my Criterion channel than I have had, than I've seen for the last three years, just because I now have a weekly film club with a group of friends who I don't get a chance to go and have a beer with. So, you know, the need and the um, desire to consume um, great content has never been higher. And I just always believe, and maybe that's because I come from a marketing perspective, but that if their need is there, we will find a way to fill it. And so I just want to encourage um, young filmmakers and not so young filmmakers that this is a great time to be writing and thinking and, um, and looking around and being inspired by what it is you're seeing because People need it. People need it. People crave it. Well, that brings up a couple questions. One is like, um, from a practical perspective, and I'm, I'm an independent filmmaker, which a lot of independent filmmakers' response to this sort of thing is just ignore all the rules, uh, which would be really risky right now, but surprisingly, there'd be a lot of them that'll do it. Um, but like, what kind of uh, protections and who's enforcing like how how will an independent filmmaker move forward that incurring these huge costs of constant testing and you know all the physical structures that a larger production can have to keep people safely separated um how do they approach that where do they get that support where do they get that information where you know i think caleb you said something about you guys providing maybe i think you said something a legal perspective but is there something you can offer there for filmmakers yeah, I would say from a press standpoint there, I mean, even outside of Movie Maker Magazine, there are a number of resources where these publications, us included, are, you know, having producers write about their experience, you know, becoming COVID compliant. What did that look like? And there are, you know, tons of different takeaways from all of those pieces. Um, we have a producer that shot a feature with Dion Taylor uh, during the pandemic, uh, kind of a very, really small set, and he just wrote about that entire experience. And there are a lot of those, and I think you can really take away a lot of, you know, different things. Uh, from the legal point of view, we have a, you know, an indie law uh, entertainment lawyer, David Pierce, who has done a number of slam dance panels. And basically, he talks to, he takes readers' questions like, what type of insurance do I need? Um, you know, does this classify, Is it, how much more is this going to cost me? And he's just like, very frankly, like, sort of. You know, as lawyers do, they're not going to sugarcoat it, just tell you like, this is what you can kind of expect going forward. And if you decide that you want to kind of skirt corners here and there, like, you know, it's a bad idea. And this is why as well. And so I think, you know, I would encourage listeners, I mean, obviously, a good first step is listening to this panel with these filmmakers, you know, who have experienced shooting during COVID um, to seek out those other resources as well. And even, cool. even reach out to those people. I think a lot of those producers are, you know, w more than willing to kind of dialogue with you if you're a filmmaker. Yeah. The COVID insurance thing is just kind of getting started and it's, um, it's really expensive as you might expect. So I think um, a lot of people are just going without it at the moment, especially probably this, you know, the very small productions. Um, but it's going to be an interesting field to see if people can really afford to insure uh, productions against COVID, um, and, but it's kind of just getting started. But an, another thing that's happening is that uh, a lot more people want to shoot outside the United States. So I don't know if um, if anyone else uh, has anything to say about that. But you know, most people are looking at that as an easier place to anything outside the United States as being easier to film in than inside the United States. Does anyone else um, has anyone else talked about that? I haven't heard too much about that, but I know a lot of people that have been shooting outside the United States just to get cheaper labor and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're bringing a lot more production there because restrictions are a little uh, looser in some places. Um, but that still doesn't absolve them of any liability that, that might yeah. mm -hmm. arise out of, you know, mm -hmm. the way they choose to manage their production. Uh, Marta, I'm curious, uh, 
on your their protocols set up by unions by production company like uh, and those are pretty strict protocols correct like yeah and, and and both I think that the DGA is working you know closely with their members and also with closely with uh, the different distribution companies um, obviously not everyone is in agreement at all times but I, I think sure. that everyone wants to work I think ultimately yeah. the DGA wants their members to be working. So they are also really, um, there's been a lot of, you know, a lot of people suffering, honestly, mm -hmm. um, in the, in the membership. And I think that, you know, getting back up on your feet and starting to work in, in places, um, like Los Angeles, um, and New York. And as you said, Pat, um, overseas, I know there was that Iceland article in LA Times back in the summer that everyone kind of jumped on, that Netflix had a show in Iceland. Um, Iceland was inviting people to shoot over there. So I think that, you know, it, this is a time of, of tremendous um, difficulty for a lot of people in the industry, like you were saying, Caleb, not just independent filmmakers, but people who are used to working um, with, in series um, and have you know, mortgages and payments for children's, you know, schooling and everything just came to a halt. So I think with SAG, the DGA and really want their members to start working. And so, you know, obviously safely, um, safety is always first. And, you know, I've talked to my GGA rep recently and, and they're, but they are working closely with us. Uh, and they also are working closely with the distribution companies and and hopefully we'll be on everyone's on the same page so far i haven't had any issues whatsoever i'm really happy with everything that's you know i've been treated with you know in, in the utmost uh with the utmost respect and and also creatively um so that's also i know um, a lot of people are afraid about that like that was one of the things that my friends and i would talk about it's like okay well things will be safe but what's going to happen to the creative element like what are we going to be able like how much time are we going to have how much play are we going to be able to have like what what are we going to be able to do um and so far it seems like this show that i'm on I'm very lucky everyone really wants it to be the best it can be and they don't want to cut corners in anything that they're doing so we'll see how it goes yeah it's uh, it's in process so yeah, yeah we're right in it um yeah which brings up the question of the sort of creative uh, perspective like um how much is this going to impact the way stories are told what kind of stories are told um our story is going to have to include people with masks <laughs> you know all the like and people are going to say oh that's a that's not a real that's not really present day if people are walking around without masks, you know, I mean, how much is that impacting the formulation of stories and ideas? Just your opinions at this point and, and what filmmakers should be thinking about when they do their work or not thinking about, maybe not even thinking about just writing what they want to write. What, what, what would you, Jacques, uh, are, are you working on anything that's like, um, takes place during a pandemic or have you thought about that? In any I have, I have, I, I have not because I have projects that I was working on before this all hit so i'm just you know polishing those and getting things together and um so focusing on those things but yeah the next thing i do i i have to think about that like what is what is that story uh, gonna look like because if it's gonna be present day then it deals with present day realities and do i want you know i don't want to make up necessarily a pandemic film we don't want to see nothing but that we don't want to see nothing but people with masks on uh so you know what are the realities of the type of stuff we're going to create in the in the near future. I, mean, I can just say from a client perspective, it's been really interesting to hear what my clients say in terms of how they are resolving and solving this. One of my clients decided to do an animated or we proposed an animated piece for them, a, a three minute animated film rather than um, something live action. Um, so 
you know, that was sort of their solve, but in it are people. And we had a long discussion about whether we put masks on them or no masks and yeah. decided that in some scenes, it was really appropriate to have people in masks. And in other scenes, if you were just with a family or someone solo, that it was okay not to see a mask. So there's a mixture of it. And generally speaking, what has been really interesting and so um, encouraging for me is that my clients have not only just wanted to acknowledge and recognize the pandemic in their creative, but they also want to talk about the social unrest and the links between the pandemic and climate change and Black Lives Matter and all of it. And they want the work that is representing the brand to acknowledge it without being um, exploitive or um, so socially sort of too much. They, they want to be a part of building a new solution and being part of um, acknowledging the fact that there is so much unrest. And, and I'm, I really appreciate that. It's, that's a hard place for a brand to come to um, when they're also financially feeling the pinch. Um, but for the most part, I've been very encouraged by, oh yeah, we have to acknowledge where we are right now. And that includes not just the pandemic, but also the social unrest and uncomfortable conversations that are going on all over America. Yeah, just the general realities of the world we're living in. Um, yeah, I wonder uh, like how much of this is gonna be permanent? You know, what, what, cause we have this pandemic, but it seems like we have a little pandemic every so often and they're getting more and more virulent. And who knows what the next one's going to be like, because there will probably be a next one. Um, so um, I'm curious, like how, what you guys think are, you know, of these new structures in place to protect people from each other uh, for various reasons, but mostly for the pandemic. Uh, like how much of that you think is going to be permanent? Like uh, Marta said, like Zoom meetings, or, or uh, maybe you were not talking just about meetings, but uh, Zoom is a big part of the future, perhaps. Um, you know, what else do you see structurally that will be part of the future of creating media and in light of what we're dealing with now? I think on a positive, sorry, uh, on a positive note, the writer who wrote the piece about shooting during the pandemic was saying, there's less waste because, you know, we've been doing paper uh, call sheets for years and now all, all of that is a PDF on your phone. And so we're not, you know, printing out hundreds of papers for everybody um, as well. And so that's a, that's a good sign, I think. And so I think there are little things that, you know, could have been adapted before the pandemic. It was just kind of the industry standard. And now that we're kind of forced to do it, it's sort of like, well, we probably could have and should have been doing these things before um, you know, I was on a film set, you know, pre-pandemic and, you know, I had salsa, chips and salsa at craft services and my friends like shared chips and salsa are like a recipe for getting everybody on set sick. And so that was even before, you know, there was all this thought of like, and that was already kind of well known. So I think all of those little things were kind of already sort of on their way out. And this, the pandemic kind of just like sped that up and kind of made everything a little more efficient in that regard. Yeah, that's, a, that's an a interesting question in the chat about um, using a bubble concept. And I think a lot of productions are using um, sort of a bubble where they've got everybody working out of one hotel and they're trying to minimize the amount of people going back and forth from the hotel. Um, so I think that's something that could possibly also um, uh, exist after the pandemic is just the idea of kind of keeping people a little more contained just in case there's some kind of safety issue. And um, I don't know, maybe it ends up being cost effective as well to, to just um, keep everybody in a bubble. But it's, it's sure not easy because a lot of people have to go home to their families and everything. Yeah, and the, the bubble costs, you know, like whatever that bubble looks like, uh, it's expensive, especially for an independent filmmaker or, or no budget filmmaker. Um, there's also an interesting question about um, the, the festival circuit going forward, but more in, in, a, in a larger perspective is like the, how we are able to consume the media that's getting created going forward. Um, how do you think 
that's going to look for filmmakers? How is that going to impact them? And how, where, what should filmmakers be thinking about now about how their work gets viewed in the future? Well, I had a friend who uh, premiered online. Um, her film was supposed mm -hmm. to be obviously out. Um, she, but unfortunately, because of the pandemic, she had to have it online. Uh, they did, producers decided to do an Eventbrite um, screening and she sold it to the studio. Wow. So, like, I think if you're, if you've got good content, it's still going to get bought and it's still going to get seen. And I think this Eventbrite thing is great. I think that it really, um, I, I was, you know, a part of the audience and there were over 200 people. Mm. Um, so I think that, you know, we're already online, especially younger people. Um, I know it sounds nuts, but you know, it, it's, you just keep making content, like you were saying, Allison, people are going to want it. There's a need, it's gonna be fulfilled. So it's up to us to keep creating so we can fulfill that need. Um, but I think Susan's film is a great example of that. And, you know, uh, she sold a movie. <laughs> It's, it can happen. Um, and what I answered in the chat was with festivals, I was at the Sundance Film Festival um, for my film and then went on the festival circuit. And the festival circuit, sure, there's a lot of fun and, you know, there's a lot of partying and all that kind of stuff that filmmakers love to do. But for me, it was the camaraderie and meeting other filmmakers, uh, having, um, Re really great friendships and and true um inspire like really getting inspired and i think that you can still do that and you can meet producers and you can meet other writers and filmmakers so that you can keep creating and i think it's really important to create like your own kind of group of people that inspire you um i have a weekly meeting uh with my writer director friends and we're actually sharing content with each other and giving each other notes. So you, you, you can't use situations like this to avoid being a part of something. You have to go out of this feeling of being trapped inside and you have to keep moving forward in any way that you can. Like you, it's really important. I think you said it, Allison, like that you keep creating and you keep moving on and you and you have these if you have ideas do something about it there are producers out there looking for content there are other writers and who want to team up with people you just have to keep moving forward um we, we can't we can't say that oh well this happened so therefore look it's all drying up I mean, you can but you know there are people out there selling films like yeah. my friend Susan. so why not just try you know, I think it, it, it behooves us to try. What, can I ask what kind of a platform did she sell it for? Was it to a streaming platform? You know what, I didn't ask. Hmm. I, I think so, I, but I did not ask. We were just so excited. She's a, she's a part of our, um, our weekly group and we all just were screaming so loudly, so happy for her um, because she hasn't, you know, she, uh, on a personal note, she, you know, she's had a rough time as an indie filmmaker. And so it was such a big thing. Um, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, it's huge. And so, but she was like, look, I'm, I'm hearing this is a really good time for people like us who make movies under, she makes movies under a million dollars. Like, I think this movie was like $250,000. So she's kind of amazing that way. Um, so I think that it's really important to look at these look at your scripts, right, that you have. Like if you have a script that you haven't looked at for a really long time, take a look at it, give it to somebody to get notes that you trust and keep moving forward. Because a lot of us have stuff that we put on the back burner. Now is the time to take a look at that and see if it's actually worthy of being a part of the Sundance Labs because the spring is coming, you know, and they're taking submissions. So it's still, things are still happening. Just look, look for the resources. Yeah, they're going to figure stuff out, you know, so that we it can. It's just build. so encouraging seeing people going to the Venice Film Festival. I know that's kind of a rarefied existence and not many of us were able to travel to Venice, but to see people like Christine Vachon and, you know, who just hadn't been in movie theaters for so many months and just being so excited 
to get to go to movie theaters and hang out on a kind of limited basis with people again. It was it was just nice to see that come back in some way, even if we might be a little ways further from it in the US. Um, but I think it was just gave us a little bit of hope that um, there will still be film festivals, um, even in real life film festivals in the future. And yeah, I look a little different. Oh, go ahead, Kim. I was gonna say that's a change I, I, I sense will, uh, will sort of stay going forward, which is I think a lot of these bigger festivals are seeing the benefit of maintaining some sort of online component. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, a CPH docs person was talking about this grandmother in another country who never would have traveled to Amsterdam to this festival, but you know, bought an online pass and watched all these films. And so I think a lot of these festivals are gonna, uh, you know, marry the sort of in-person event, which I think has a ton of value and is sorely missed with sort of this online networking, online engaging through Q and A's and on streaming films. So I think that's a, a net positive going forward. Yeah, I, I heard so many people who wanted to watch the um, American Utopia and what was it, $25 to watch a Toronto film? And they were like, well, I guess I could swing that. Maybe it's worth it because I just really want to see it. Um, so even if it's a little higher than a normal festival ticket, it might still be worth it if you have, um, you know, a couple people at your house or something. Yeah, and that's still cheaper than flying to Toronto. Flying a pass. Yeah. Um, you can have your special bank account just for festivals now. But it is true. I feel like I bought a couple of festival passes that I probably would never have gotten a chance to go to those festivals or seen the films because. A, I have the time that I'm not driving to different meetings. How nice is that? And, you know, B, I just realized like all I have to do is sign up and then I can watch. And it's, that's great. But, you know, I, I don't want to underestimate um, the pleasure and joy and inspiration that you get when you are with people in person. And, I just also want to acknowledge for everybody who's on this call or listening in that it's, a, it's okay to be sad and depressed and maybe sometimes need to not be 100% creative. You know, we all need to really take care of ourselves at this time. And I find when I'm feeling kind of down and not so creative, the best thing for me to do is turn to someone who is creating and support them and support them maybe even more than I might necessar not necessarily do you know, back before the, um, even as you're cursing them with envy. Yes. I can <laughs> curse them with praise and envy. <laughs> Tell them how amazing it is. But I think, you know, as a creative community, it's just a really important time to be each other's rocks because everybody well, needs that. Well, that's, that's the next point I want to bring up is like, so we're six months into this. Um, and if, Filmmakers out there, if you're like me, you, you wasted a good part of that six months just doing I don't know what. Um, but you want to make the most of this time. And it may be another six months. Who knows what's going to happen So uh, before things are, you know, mostly up and running. Um, so what, what would you say to filmmakers how to maximize this time? What parts of the whole uh, filmmaking universe are, are dynamic? and will stay dynamic and you know how how would you what would you say to a filmmaker to maximize this this period um uh, you know this sort of time out that we've been in this prolonged time out um you know what would you say to them where, where should they put their focus right now i i'm gonna just stick with what i said previously which is i i know that this is like you said, Allison, it's hitting people differently. You don't know what people are living at with at home. Um, but if you are creative and you are a writer, it's time to write. It's time for you to pick up that, you know, laptop and start writing and create community around yourself. Um, I've done it. I, you know, chose people who I trusted and we've been doing it now for four months and it was life changing for all of us. Um, and it was, it's really important to keep moving through it. I, I really think that stagnation is one of the biggest killers of creativity and creative expression and your spirit. And uh, for me, meditation and yoga have been life-saving and this writing group as well. 
and I just know that if I chose to sit in my feelings, I wouldn't even be on this panel right now. And I wouldn't have a job right now because we are very sensitive. Creative people are, you know, that's why we do what we do um, because of our sensitivities. But we can also use that to help us. And I think if we engage in ways that are available to us, then we have to use them. Otherwise we are then just observers. And I don't like being an observer. <laughs> that's not my job. I like to be in it. I like to be in it. I like to be working. I like to be doing stuff. So if you're anything like me, it's time for you to sit down. And if you have an idea, write an outline and share it. Get out there. I know if, even if you have a film right now and you're in the festival circuit, still be writing, still be moving through it. It doesn't mean that you can't be creating something right now. Cool. Great. Does anybody have something to add to that? Um, there's a question about how should a filmmaker approach getting a media attention now, which I think is a pretty difficult question. Okay. Uh, Jump yeah, I don't know if I have a good answer, but I, I would love to talk about it, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think, I think I, I have a lot of filmmaker friends and working in press They're you know, they're constantly asking me like, how do I get press coverage on this? How do I like approach this? And I think, you know, without distribution, it's incredibly hard. I think if you have distribution that usually they're going to hire a PR firm, which then reaches out to us. We have a relationship with that PR firm. So, I mean, I think Pat can back this up, but like uh, if you're in press, if you're an editor, you're getting hundreds of pitches a day to cover films. Even during a pandemic, you're getting a ton of, hey, can you write about this film? Do you want to talk to this director? So it's, it's really hard to sort of zero in on what the good pitches are. Um, so I think that, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, without the networking opportunities, I, I think for a filmmaker, a lot of the networking opportunities are obviously t towards the distributors, but I think there's also a lot of opportunities for filmmakers to interact with press at film festivals. And so with that, without that in person, it does become more difficult. And so I think you have to really double down and be more active, you know, socially with, you know, these live events with, you know, um, attending live screenings, film festivals, reaching out to people online. Uh, you know, Ted Hope in a Q&A like last week said like, hey, my DMs are open, I, I read them a lot. And so it's like, you know, reach out to Ted Hope. I'm not saying he's going to, you know, buy your movie or something, but like be active in those channels. Uh, but it is a question I think a lot about and I do think it is difficult for, you know, a low budget filmmaker that doesn't have distribution to sort of get press coverage uh, without, you know, if you're at a festival, press might write about your film and that's a good first start and gets the ball rolling. Uh, but outside of that, you know, it's, it's still an open question, I think, in my mind. I think it's a really hard time because there's been a lot of cutbacks also in digital media. So there's probably fewer outlets. And I'm sorry, my plumber is actually sawing as we speak. <laughs> um, but anyway, I, I think that um, maybe finding a champion for your film has become more important than ever before. It's kind of, um, you know, the way uh, authors reach out to prominent other authors to get blurbs for their books. I think maybe that's really the way to cut through some of the, the clutter um, with your film as well. Um, one of the films in the competition, Residue, was picked up by Ava DuVernay's distribution company, Array, um, which picks up very small films. Um, I can't speak for her at all, but I can't imagine that that, that, that they pay very much to pick up a film, but what it does is it makes it part of a label um, and gives it a distribution strategy, And but it's basically just a seal of approval. Um, so, you know, as well as helping with, with some distribution. So if you can just ally yourself with someone who supports you, whose name people recognizes, I think, at this point in time, that's probably a really good way to get attention. I think we've moved beyond the age of like having a gimmick for your film that gets attention. I've gotten a lot of press releases for like, we were the very first film to shoot in quarantine and we were in a house in Arkansas and there were just five of us. So you have to write about us because we were the first. And it's like, well, that's nice, but it's not really ultimately that great of a story. So, um, just try to focus on who your audience is and how you're going to reach out to them and have a, a strong social media plan and please have some good stills and 
and a good trailer and you know just the the stock things but i think it's even more important now um to kind of to reach out to be in a conversation with other people on social media both viewers and other filmmakers and just try and find those people that that can support you and and obviously maybe eventually even buy your film but even if they're not in a position to buy it just um you know getting getting their support i think um it just helps people so much to know oh uh so and so like this film or so and so has worked with this person now i understand kind of more what they're about yeah and in building your media alliances i would just say um uh know who you're talking to like make sure that what you're bringing to them is appropriate to what they're doing what their interests are where their focus is um because i have a lot of filmmakers who just knock on doors willy-nilly and uh, it, it, you're just wasting a lot of people's time and and part of this whole pandemic situation i think uh a couple of you guys alluded to it is it's cut a lot of the fat off you know when you're communicating with people there's a lot more focus than um than i've than i've seen in the past you know of course there's no uh there's not a replacement for live face-to-face -face contact and energies you feel from people and and the beauty of all that but there's also uh, some good stuff with this because when I am meeting with people on Zoom and everything, it's very focused. Like we don't chit chat too much about a bunch of different things. And I'm pretty clear about who I'm talking to and why. And I think filmmakers need to have that in general should have that same kind of clarity, especially when they're dealing with uh, the media and trying to create interest in their films and stuff. Cause you guys get deluged with so much stuff, you know, and, it's also so much of an opportunity to, though to reach out to people all over the world you know i don't i don't know where all you guys are but but you can get um pull a panel together or an interview for your film or just you know any kind of event with people from all over the world and it's so cool um people are kind of relatively available right now and it's um it's so much easier to get them to sign on for an hour zoom conversation than it was to get them to show up at some auditorium at 8 p.m you know in the middle of la or something so just take advantage of that and reach out to people all over the world that that you want to work with or talk to okay cool and i would say uh this might not be pandemic related, but I would say like always remain positive as a filmmaker, even when you're getting those rejections for festivals, etc. But I screened for a few festivals and I can't tell you how many like good films that I really enjoy didn't quite make the cut, but that name of that filmmaker goes on a list for me as press. Like I want to, you know, next time this person makes a film, I want to know what it is. It goes on that list for those festival programmers. They're kind of like, okay, this wasn't quite there. Something like didn't quite work, but I, I like their voice. I like the tone that they kind of strike. Um, so I'm going to kind of keep track of this person. So I guess you don't, you don't really know like how close you are to a lot of these situations unless, you know, the festival tells you. Um, so just always kind of, you know, um, as Marta was saying, like, you know, just keep writing, keep focused and, you know, don't, uh, don't get too down when things aren't always breaking your way, uh, you know, on a month to month basis. Well, that's what I was going to wrap it up here by, uh, getting a takeaway from everybody is, I don't know if that's your takeaway or you want to add more to it, but I'd love to hear from you guys, you know, one or two things that you'd really like uh, the audience to take away from this discussion. Uh, do it alphabetically, Allison. <laughs> you have something to say first. Um, no, thank you so much for hosting the panel and thank you to uh, my fellow people. I'm really thrilled to be a part of it. I, you know, it's a, interesting time. I wish we were all in person in front of each other talking, but um, yeah, it's just nice to meet everyone. Awesome. Yeah. It's a, it's a, there's not like we're going to provide tons of answers because we're just all learning, right? It's, it's, it's new for all of us and we're in process. We're experiencing it. But um, there was definitely, I felt like a lot of, a lot of great takeaways from this, some positive things, you know, uh, uh, that have come out of this, some opportunities, that you know might not have existed otherwise um and it's just a matter of like focusing yourself in that direction but do you guys have anything else to add caleb pat or um, marta no yeah i was talking to a filmmaker yesterday and we both mm -hmm. kind of agreed that unfettered creative like 
uh, you know, freedom isn't a good thing in most cases. So like a filmmaker getting whatever they want, however much money. And so limitations in a lot of ways, like really aid, like sort of creative processes. So I, I guess I would encourage filmmakers to not look at all of these changes as mere obstacles and kind of like really rack their brain creatively to make something better because of like the limitations. And obviously artifice is a big part of cinema. And so if you're shooting people in different rooms, whatever, like use that artifice to benefit your film, not necessarily as something to overcome in every instance. I guess that would be my encouragement. Cool. All right, is that it? I'd say Mark? reach out. I would just say one thing that I did during um, this time is I reached out to someone I always wanted to work with and hadn't worked with yet. And now we're working on something together. Um, Sounds good. So take that op opportunity to do that now because you never know. You know, do it all. Do it all, do what you can. All right, thank you guys. Um, thank you. Thank I you. Think that does it. I, and if people have questions, I'm sure they can filter them through the festival and they'll get to us and we'll, we'll answer them individually. But thank you all.